This is the Push Shift Podcast, a raw look at the hospitality industry. Um, how you doing? Good. How you doing? Oh, good. Keep them busy. Keep them busy. It seems like everybody that's in our sort of line of work has pivoted in a way that uh, we've gone away from the custom, like the, we've got a lot of our clients have pay, bailed out and canceled contracts and all this sort of stuff. But then we've started doubling down on this sort of stuff and doing way more broadcasting, way more podcasts, way more writing, that sort of thing. Yeah. You have this punishing schedule this week. My God, <laughs> I don't know how you are managing all that. Uh, I mean, I do this a lot too. And so like, but normally there's a lot of technical difficulty. You have to onboard people and make sure that they, their mics are working, that they're connecting the right things. And usually that's all that in itself is, is typically a lot of work. Yeah. I don't, I don't mind it. It is a huge amount of, uh, it is a huge amount of work to keep up. Uh, I did a stream last night with Jesse and I think, I think I don't think a lot of people understand the, the, um, the necessary concept of what happens after you do the live stream. So you do a live stream and you've got your, your video and then you turn that video into an audio and then you turn that video into an actual podcast. And there's a whole track load of things that go along with it that I think people don't really get. And then I actually send a lot of my podcasts through to a, a guy I, I work with on Fiverr who mm-hmm. transcribes everything and then turns it into an article for like medium and LinkedIn which took me a really long time to find someone that could do that. Yeah, this is, um, this is, this is called content spinning, if you guys don't know what yeah. that means. But, um, but uh, using a piece of content and making sure that that's available on multiple different platforms. Um, you know, video is the best because it becomes, it's, uh, you can use that for LinkedIn, you can use that for uh, Instagram stories, you can use it for all kinds of different things. Generally speaking, uh, people are sitting at home consuming content and media um, because for a lot of people, that's all you can do. But for a whole lot of other people, that is their job. And so that is kind of the message that I would love to get out to bartenders and servers and hospitality workers that can't work right now is that um, content producers, um, uh, c- producing content is a real job and people do make a living doing it. And uh, having an understanding of how the internet works and how media works um, is a very valuable thing. And everything that has ever been knowable about this is on YouTube. And, you know, it's, well, that's the thing is you just Google it. Everybody's like, yeah, hey, you do that. You, you, you just G O O G L E dot com and Google whatever you need. Like I've taught myself all this stuff based on, based on that. And yeah. So, and, if, uh, yeah. and if you need motivation, check out Gary V. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's my, that's my daily motivation. Like I, it's just about documenting and I've been talking yeah. to a lot of, uh, cause here in BC, uh, our wine culture, is huge. We have 250, 300 wineries in the province. Um, and a lot of them are doing, um, a lot of them are doing, uh, their new releases. So it's the season to do new vintages, but no one can do tastings. So there's no OP tastings. There's no retail tastings. You can't talk like you can't do a massive tasting with people. So they're spitting. So I'm trying to tell them how to do it. Like everybody's like, I'm just going to do a a YouTube video, a, a, a Facebook video. I'm like, yeah, but you can use that video. Like, 17 times and break it up (laughs) yeah a lot of people don't really fully grasp the fact that um that the relationship with brands is much more valuable in the long term than like the actual brand itself in a lot of cases Mm -hmm. um and that's why it's i I think it's just so important to shout out all the brand ambassadors that are that are hustling out there that are you know yes providing a lot of educational content for their brands but um there's a lot of emotional investment in there too Um, And they are trying to be active and supportive. And, um, you know, even though they can't get liquor to lips, they can't do cocktail demos and they can't uh, share exactly what the, what the flavor profile of their spirits are. They can definitely share what the virtues of the brand are and the brands are only as strong as the people behind them. So, um, you know, just, uh, you know, I see what my wife does every day out in the field and and how she's like very supportive and how she buys t-shirts and she makes sure that they have enough booze and, and, um, and it's, uh, it's, like the, I feel like the brand ambassadors are kind of an un, uh, unsung hero right now a little bit, um, even though they do work on behalf of a brand and they are trying to, well, you know, eventually sell spirits. But well, I think it's the, I think it's the pivot. I think uh, the, um, well, public perception anyway. I think it's sort of showing the back end stuff that the brand ambassadors have always been doing. 
but in a in a different light. Like everybody looks at brand ambassadors and say, oh, you go out on Friday night and you drink your drinks and you bar hop and that's pretty much what you do. Um, and do a seminar every now and then. Kiss tables, touch mm-hmm. babies, that sort of thing. And uh, it's one of those things that you sort of look at now is that all the back end stuff that they used to do in the really boring brand meetings on Monday mornings and the catch ups on Wednesday mornings with the team and all that sort of stuff is now at the forefront. And the drinking bar hopping is like, gone it's no longer around yeah yeah for sure uh hopefully not for too much longer but you know who knows uh i i mean you, you guys have a uh a, a great prime minister who actually kind of understands how viruses work mm-hmm. we have a king um who doesn't really care <laughs> so so we'll uh we'll, we'll see what happens but hopefully uh all of our sick people don't get your people sick yeah we, we've been told uh june 1st at the at the earliest before restaurants and bars can reopen so uh, it's, it's it's a that, substantial time i i think uh mayor de blasio just closed major events for the month of june mm-hmm. so so let's kick it back to the very very beginning so i always like to start off with this is like what is uh where did you where did you get your start and how did you uh, get your start so i was um i when I was a really young kid, my mom told me that I would be a great bartender or a great shrink. Um, and I wasn't, I uh, wasn't so great at school. Um, and I didn't really care too much about learning in, in the traditional sense. So I, um, you know, eventually did a bunch of odd jobs. And, and uh, when I was in my late teens, early twenties, um, that's when I first got my first job behind a bar. Um, and that was, because in California, you have to be 21. So um, I started working at this uh, Irish uh, Irish pub called Hoolies. I uh, started washing dishes, bussing tables um, as a 20 year old. Um, and, uh, and then kind of worked my way up to being a, a bar back uh, uh, server. And then I eventually got this job working at this place called Shooter's Cocktails. And it was a complete massive disaster. Uh, it, was in, it was completely surrounded by trailer parks. It was, um, you know, it was a, probably the most important experience that I'd, I'd had behind a bar because it, the, the, you know, the, the characters that showed up were like total derelicts. So they would put a $20 bill on the bar, drink butt heavies until they couldn't drink anymore. And whatever was left was my tip. Um, and so, and I would work Monday through Friday from 10 AM to 6 PM. And I did that for a long time. And, uh, that was probably, probably the best experience I'd had because you get a real sense for humanity and you become kind of become part of the community. And, um, you know, down the line, I ended up moving up to New York to record an album as a drummer. Um, I was only intended to be here for three months and that was 15 years ago. And, uh, so I got a, you know, got a shit job and then moved on to another shit job. And then finally got an opportunity to work at a place, um, that was, you know, crushing speed. That was at BB Kings actually, um, in Times Square since closed. Um, and, uh, not because of this, but because they're just terrible people there. Um, but, uh, anyways, <laughs> that's a, that's a, that's a longer story. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, I, I eventually got a job, um, through that to another place. And then that linked me up to eventually what uh, this bar that was called the Randolph, which was, I, I like to consider my big break. Um, you know, I was working there. It was, uh, they, they were, we were selling $9 kettle and sodas all day long. Um, and it got a little bit noisy, got in trouble with the neighbors. Um, they, cha- the owners changed changed the concept into a cocktail bar and hired a guy named Sasha Petrasky to train us all. And so that was when um, we really learned how to um, not only what the composition of a good drink was, but was also kind of how to be um, a gentleman, like how to like, like kind of the interaction between the guests and, and, and and service staff and kind of what that meant. And that was a a very cerebral time for me because uh, not only did I learn the most in, in such a short amount of time, but I also, um, was just in the presence of a master. And, uh, we got in the short amount of time that we had with him. Um, he, we were right down the street from milk and honey. So he would take us down, um, like while the bar was being rebuilt or while we were doing something or they wanted to show us something specific, they would take us down to milk and honey before the bar was even open and teach us how to make a daiquiri or teach us how to make a South side or whatever. And that was just a very pivotal moment in my career. And I just can't thank the owners of that bar enough for making that decision because it, that was the difference between me being um, a struggling musician for the rest of my life and uh, really doubling down on being a professional bartender. And, and that was when, you know, I, I don't even know what year it was, but 
Um, it was before it was, it was in the early days of the cocktail revival. And I'm um, just, uh, you know, you could go to Pegu club and go to EO and you could go to milk and honey and mm -hmm. you could go to B flat and you could go to, um, angel, uh, um, oh, oh my God, uh, angel share. And these were, you know, relatively unknown. Only the, only the, the cocktail nerds in the city knew about these places and they, and they weren't like quite crushed yet. Well, they were crushed actually because they, not a lot of people knew about them and there wasn't a whole lot of competition. So um, that's kind of how I got my start in this game. Um, and, you know, eventually, uh, and then my second biggest break, which is like still what I'm writing to this day is that I have Death Co on my menu or on my, on my resume. And so I worked there for two years um, and that was, you know, everything I had learned previous to that point was kind of exploded and, um, and rearranged because the level of intensity um, in building drinks there was completely different. And there wasn't the same logic as there was in what we call like the quote, Mr. Potato Head um, mm -hmm. uh, mixology where you're like, well, you know, um, a business is just a daiquiri with gin or a, um, uh, you know, a mojito is just a daiquiri with soda and mint. Um, you know, there it was, there it was just like, okay, well, you need to add two drops of this half teaspoon of that quarter and quarter half. But we developed this whole shorthand, um, and how to articulate exactly what was in drinks because you had to have a massive lexicon, um, from people ordering from past and present menus. And uh, that was never my strength. Uh, the creative, the being creative on that level was never my strength. And, uh, and definitely remembering all those cocktails was not my strength, but, um, because it wasn't my strength, um, I gained an entire dimension of understanding of how to build drinks and that, um, eventually leveraged my, uh, into a consulting career. So how did, what, well, how and why, why did you, cause I know a lot of bartenders, sort of uh get started after a couple of years they want to get into consulting what sort of what was what was the driver behind you becoming a consultant um and sort of how what sort of steps did you take to get it done well somebody offered me a job that was the that was the first <laughs> thing they said hey can you help us build our bar and i was like yeah okay um what i didn't know then that i know now is that i was grossly underqualified for that um i didn't have um you know understanding how to make a drink does not a good consultant make. Uh, I mean, there's obviously so much more to it. There's P&Ls, there's understanding of poor costs, there's understanding of operations, there's the interpersonal element, there's the compliance element. Um, none of these things I really understood. I, did, I wasn't an operator, I was a drink maker. And um, you know, I would, you know, if I could take it back, I would have spent several more years behind the bar um, because uh, I had so much more to learn. You know, I just, uh, my, my career trajectory just went in a different direction because um, I, it, because the opportunity was there, but uh, in retrospect, I probably wouldn't have quit my job. Should How would the, well what, what have you done since? Because I know what year was that? What year did you start consulting on uh, on a more of a full time basis? I think I quit my my last shift job in two thousand two two thousand three. Yes. Yeah, no, like no, 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 no. That's not right. That's not even close. Uh, I graduated high school in nineteen ninety eight. <laughs> no, it was more like 2009, I think, 2010. See, that's, that's the hard thing is I think uh, I, I talk to a, a lot of kids and I always sort of keep reminding people that the internet isn't that old. Social media really isn't that old. Um, and so when you talk about like learning curves and stuff like that, it's not like you could just go and Google it like we were talking about at the very beginning. Like you can't just go, oh, how do I do this? How do I do a costing? Like I remember... I learned how to do costings from an Australian bartender article in like 2002. And I seared the, the, the formula they had in the article into my brain and then just figured out how to do it on Excel spreadsheets. And so how did you, how did you take that learning curve? Like was obviously, is it got to be a certain level of humility to going, Oh fuck. I probably shouldn't be doing this right now. <laughs> yeah, the humility comes after the after the major fuck ups for sure. Um, so, like you know, after the train wreck, that's when you're like, wait a second, maybe my confidence was a little bit misplaced here. Maybe, um, <laughs> maybe I'm not as as, uh, as one important or as um, as knowledgeable as I thought it was, um, because you know, there's just entire dimensions of the of the business that I didn't understand. Um, you know, it takes. Um, 
I can remember very vividly my biggest mistakes. And um, those have often been a motivator for me to not uh, make the same mistake twice. Um, you know, there are like the, the, the scale of the mistakes tend to get smaller as you get more experienced. But um, mistakes are a vital part of my business. Uh, I mean, I, I, you know, if you if you stop making mistakes, if you start doing everything perfectly, then um, you know, you're, you're just not learning and you're just not growing. And as we're finding out now, um, you, you know, like you have to have this learner's mentality because who knows what's going to happen. And, um, especially as, uh, an independent contractor and a, a, as a freelancer, um, you know, your job is to get a job. And so you, your credibility really rests and relies on what your last job success was or failure. And, um, you know, for me, so, so like my reputation is, is my value. And so by not being able to recover from mistakes, I would be out of business. So it's important to like really, um, internalize your mistakes and to learn from them and grow from them and try to uh, improve your process and your workflow a little bit better. And how have you made the the leap? Because I know that you do a lot of like, we, even in the very beginning, we started talking about brand and brand and awareness and, and consumer confidence and all this sort of stuff. How did you make the leap from creating a cocktail menu to uh, knowing more about brand scope and, and marketability and social media and stuff like that? Is it self-taught or did you do some courses or sort of trial and error? Um, a lot of trial and error, a lot of just, uh, a lot of reading, uh, and aligning myself with people who know a lot more than me. Uh, I mean, I've had a lot of different partners in the business over the years. Um, and you know, sometimes the relationships went, went great. Sometimes they didn't go so great. Um, but, um, you know, just, I don't know. I, I'm just a, a problem solver by, by nature. And, you know, that's not to suggest that I always have the right solution, but, um, you know, I'm always very intent on, uh, on finding a reasonable and plausible solution to a problem. I'm just very, um, nuts and bolts, ones and zeros, black and white that way. I mean, I just kind of, I'm good at breaking apart a problem and figuring out how to uh, make it manageable and, and solvable. Which but, biggest- but, but, but this is, I mean, that is like kind of strictly due to a lot of mentorship and, um, and a lot of just people who are, have done this before me that have been nice enough to share what they've learned with me. And that's kind of, that's part of what I love about our, our, our industry is that nothing is really that sacred. We don't really keep a whole lot too close to the vest. So, um, you know, it's really, I, I'm, I'm the child of a village. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think also in the hospitality industry, we, we try and plan in the black and white would be living in the gray. And like, it, it's uh, one of those things like you, you come in, you've got your whole day prepped and then the dishwasher craps out an hour into service and you're like, okay, well, how do we fix this? Yep. And try and figure out how to fix out the, fix the dishwasher during service. Um, what's your biggest project to date? My biggest project to date oh, is yet proud. to happen. Um, <laughs> well, the one you're most I'm, proud of. Well, the one I'm most proud of right now is has got to be the Campari Academy, uh, and that is, um, you know, it's a, it's a very ambitious project. Uh, my boss is extremely uh, is extremely smart, and she has a very clear vision of what she wants to accomplish, and that yields um, clear direction for me to to help her kind of execute her vision, and that is. Um, it's been a very inspiring time, especially um, given the recent, uh, the tr- you know, the kind of unfolding of recent events, because um, just like everybody else, we're required to absolutely pivot what we do. Um, and uh, this is also in no small part to the staff that we have. Um, you know, we have a, a host team of, of very dedicated professionals that are also um, have all of their own talents and all of their own skills and personalities to bring. And all this is kind of funneled into a, a unified vision of, of creating um, the most advanced and um, spectacular uh, spirits training education program in the world. And so all of that, all that energy is now being focused onto digital um, uh, uh, on into onto the digital environment using all the um, all the wonderful people that work for Campari. So, if I were to say that what what am I most proud of? Uh, I'm I'm most proud of um, the the work that we've done at the at the academy. I've got two uh, bartenders from Victoria coming to the Campari Academy very shortly. I hope was, it's sooner they, than later. <laughs> they, they were supposed to be. Uh, we did the um, we did the Campari National Conference here in Victoria. Um, for ca- all of Canada uh, in February. We did a big cocktail competition, an Appleton event. And uh, 
two of the bartenders from one of the bars got one. So they, they were supposed to be in, they were supposed to be in New York next month. Oh, uh, obviously man. that's not happening, but uh, yeah, they got, a, they got a trip to the Campari Academy for the week, which is an insane, uh, insane prize from Campari Canada. That's for sure. That's really great. We're, um, we will be very happy to host them as soon as possible. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, how has your work pivoted since the pandemic has sort of hit? Obviously, um, a lot of the brands you work with, uh, I wouldn't say scrambling. I think everybody in the business has always had a good online strategy. I just think they've just quadrupled down on that now um, mm. and try to be as creative as possible um, without being redundant. Like how many, how many cocktail videos from the different brands can you really watch on Instagram in a day? Yeah. And, and I think it's important to note that, um, that those videos and those interviews that are coming out on online right now, those live videos are, um, a great way to validate the existence of the people who are creating them. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you know, everybody's in this together right now. So like while, uh, off-premise sales may be blowing up right now on-premise sales are not. And so, uh, the brands, all the big brands are also feeling this, uh, this big thing. And, um, most of them are continuing to employ their teams to divert their energy into this online education. So even just by showing up to one of these trainings is, um, is a big deal. And it's a, it's a very important thing for, um, for not only the brands, but also for the people that work for the brands. Um, but as far as pivoting is concerned, um, I think you and I are, are alike in the, in, in the, in the, uh, in the respect that um, media is very, very important. Mm -hmm. And uh, being able to produce content that is meaningful and actionable and uh, that is valuable, first of all, valuable to the people who are consuming it um, is not only good for your brand, it's good for um, you know, your clients, you gain visibility. Um, and you know, I think media is definitely the future because um, I don't think that there's any scenario that exists that uh, doesn't change um, how we, um, go to bars and restaurants in the future. I think, I think, I think, I think this, I think this, this, uh, effect will, the ripple effects of COVID-19 will go on forever. Do you think this is sort of, I still, I still, you, you may not hear it in the U S but I still hear a lot of, um, resistance to like full on social media marketing from big, from big brands here in Canada, like mm -hmm. national brands. Um, and so it, it, it does, it makes my head hurt when people like a brand will put post once, uh, once every two weeks. And I, I hit him up with it. I was like, you guys are posting once every two weeks. And they're like, well, that's still more than our competitor. I'm like, but that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Like you've got enough content that you could be posting four times a day. Um, do you think this is going to be pushing a social media marketing agenda that probably was still two years out? Um, and push this evolution of like acceptance of social media marketing? Well, um, I think that uh, the the market will sort itself out. Um, no doubt, this will add, add to the more the volume of of media being uh, uh, being available on social media. But hopefully, it'll also improve the, the the quality of of the content being produced on social media. I mean, as Gary V says, is like this is like an attention economy. I mean, we are always uh, bombarded and always being pulled in many many different directions um, because attention is value and um, so hopefully those old stodgy brands will kind of understand that the internet is here to stay um, and that um, there's m many more ways to connect with, with brands um, than, uh, than just by putting liquor to lips. Um, you know, there's not a, there's a causal relationship with um, sales and how people perceive a brand and um, how are you going to engage people um, in a, on a format that they look at 200 minutes a day their cell phones. Um, you know, you, you, I, I'm, I, I guess I, I'm guessing they're not buying any TV ads or anything. I'm not sure how that works in Canada, but, um, you know, it just, it just seems kind of odd to me to not, uh, engage in social media. Uh, and it's not about, it's not necessarily about publishing. It's about listening. It's like, how are I like, how are you connecting with the people who care about what you're doing? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? uh, and it's also much cheaper. I don't get it. <laughs> it is so much cheaper and you get way better analytics. Like yeah. your analytics are just so much better. Um, how have you seen uh, a lot of bars and restaurants pivoting in New York um, and changing the way they're doing? Like I've seen a ton of innovation here in Canada. Luckily enough, we've been able to do cocktail kits, but we can't sell them the way that I think you guys can. We can't sell pre-batch cocktails. We can sell like 
all the ingredients bagged up and you add alcohol to it, your own alcohol, or you can sell full bottles of alcohol and sell full bottles of alcohol and cocktail kits too. So have you seen the innovation for the for restaurants and bars in New York? Well, um, a lot of people are get, uh, doing merch, uh, which I think is really smart, uh, especially in the world of print on demand. You don't necessarily have to have your hands on product. You can drop ship it or you can have it printed on demand and then uh, sent directly to your team. So all you really have to do is have a logo um, and then you can say, hey, support our support our bar. Um, but and, you know, you go to send somebody send your your email list, send your email list a link saying this is your print full account and you know say what size of your shirt and put, uh, upload your logo to it and it sends it directly to them again you never touch the product and you get the commission on that sale and that's a great way to support brands um, also uh, a lot of people um, are, are selling gift certificates um, you know sadly a significant portion of bars are just not going to reopen uh, you know the the there's wildly speculative numbers what that is going to be, but um, it is going, going to be statistically meaningful for sure. Uh, you know, I don't want to even suggest how much that's going to, how many that's going to be, but um, you know, uh, it was a recent uh, innovation in New York that, uh, that you can sell composed cocktails to go uh, in any format. So that could be a single serving. It could be a punch size serving. Um, a lot of, uh, a lot of bars and restaurants are doing that, uh, just to keep the doors open. But you know, it's, it, it is also an exposure for the staff and, um, it's, it's those kind of things that I, I'm hoping will stay on the books after this is all over. Uh, because, um, you know, if you look at what's happening in China, um, and in APAC in general is that there's a lot of, um, this has come and gone in, in some places there. And, um, but this, but selling cocktails, composed cocktails into go containers, not necessarily even sealed containers, mm -hmm. but like a deli container or a bottle, um, that's been going on for years. And that has uh, created a whole cottage industry. And, um, you know, I was talking to Chris Louder on my podcast a, a couple of weeks ago, and he was telling me about how, um, uh, you know, they have, uh, they put a lot of effort, uh, some, some restaurant owners and bar owners have put a lot of effort into um, creating an entire experience uh, out of that cocktail. So they don't just put a co make a two or three cocktails and put it into a deli container, put a sticker on it and say, here you go, you're welcome. Uh, they, you know, make sure that the, the, the aesthetics are pleasing and that they're consistent with the image and the brand of the bar. And not only that, but also they come in these beautiful bottles that can be reused and, and, um, and that in turn turns into a token that like a, um, a piece of memorabilia from that experience. And, and I, I just wish we could get our, get out of our heads, um, about the, how important we think the actual cocktail is. Uh, there's so much more than that. And, um, if we're able to convey that, um, in, uh, in down the line, um, you know, I think that, uh, we're, we're we'll be better off for it because, um, there's just so much more to it. I know I, for me personally here in Victoria and Vancouver um, and in Toronto, uh, a lot of restaurants have decided not to open because they feel that it to go take out doesn't work with their brand. Um, and <laughs> it's, it's very, it, yeah, you're, you're pretty, I think you're going to agree exactly what I'm about to say. Um, a lot of them are like, Oh no, it doesn't plate right. It doesn't ship. It doesn't travel right. I'm like, so you're going to shut down for three to four months with absolutely no brand recognition, no social media, no nothing, trying to get the restaurant reopened. You need to like, the romancing of the way that our restaurant industry and our bar industry was three weeks ago, four weeks ago, in my opinion, is gone. Like yeah. we're, we're going into a new day. So any brand, any romance you have about the old days, which I think the hospitality industry to a degree holds on to for a little bit longer than some industries. We romance about the old days of, well, this is the way that the, the bar well was designed for 25 years and it's been fine. We shouldn't change it. Mm -hmm. um, but I think on the branding side, I think your, is your opinion in, in sort of a line where if you're not doing at least something for your consumers, your brand loyal people that you're not, you may not exist after this. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if you're not, able to deliver a product to your customer, then what does your business do? Um, and uh, if you can afford to, to take three months off because of your uh, brand standards and your, your brand principles, then, then great. 
that's that's awesome. Uh, but I know that Alinea is also doing to-go meals, mm -hmm. and <laughs> and, and uh, you know, if necessity is the mother of invention, then they they have probably not sacrificed any of their values to deliver what they're what they do to their customers. Well, they saw an eight hundred dollars sushi kit, an eight hundred dollars sushi kit from a New York sushi restaurant as well to make it home. Yeah. Like it's yeah. not even packaged sushi. It's here's all the things you need. You buy it and then you make it at home yourself. Yeah. I, I mean, for, it's for those people that, um, you know, if, if you're not going to deliver your product, if you're not going to make it accessible to, to your consumers, then they're going to figure it out or they're going to go to your competitor. Uh, and, you know, nobody is that special that people are willing to starve or, or go without um, a particular experience when they have so many other options. And New York, I mean, the restaurants are stacked on top of each other. I mean, you can't get away with that here. Um, if it was like the only grocery store in town, um, people would revolt. Um, yeah. But it's not. It's not the only shop. So, uh, you know, that goes in, that's, that's in the same bucket to me as the people that refuse to use social media to promote their brands. It's like, why? It's like, okay, like the market will iron itself out. <laughs> and it's free. <laughs> And if you're irrelevant, then you're irrelevant. And, but what know. do you think the three, like for your, for your restaurant and bar clients, what are the three to five things that you're sort of advising them to be doing right now? Well, I don't have any re bar or restaurant clients right now. Um, and I'm not really sure if I uh, will again in the future. Uh, you know, most of my, um, it's just, you know, as a, as an independent consultant, uh, you know, your job is to get a job all the time. Um, and uh, I think that, uh, there are much more interesting things that I can do rather than consult on a bar or restaurant right now. Um, and that's unfortunate to say, but uh, I'm not specifically excluding it. I mean, I, I'm, there were a couple of really exciting projects for like huge, you know, um, uh, food court style projects that were kind of coming up in New York, which are halted, of course. Um, those were really exciting to me, but um, you know, it's, it, it's really unfortunate that, um, you know, the idea of opening up an independent bar or restaurant just doesn't sound that exciting to me anymore um, because uh, the there's an actively hostile environment between the city of New York and, um, and uh, independent bar owners. And it's just very, very difficult to get anything done because the um, uh, compliance issues and um, just, it's just really hard. You know, you have to be the, I mean, the number one reason you, uh, for failure in the U in New York is under capitalization. Mm -hmm. And so it's like when you, um, put your entire life savings on the line, um, to open up a bar or restaurant and you don't really know what you're doing yourself, then there's no consultant that can really save you. Um, because it, you know, just wanting it is not enough, unfortunately. Um, so, I mean, if I were to, if I were to have clients right now, um, that were in, that were independent bars or restaurants, I'd say, um, sell it all. Get, uh, <laughs> um, so what, uh, it's tough, it's, it's, it's tough, but, uh, I mean, people, t people hire me to tell me the truth, to mm -hmm. tell them the truth. And, um, you know, there's, there's a bit of free advice is like, you know, wait and see how this, wait and see how this goes, um, before, you know, investing before cashing your 401k to open up that bar. Um, cause well, you know, things a little bit different on the West coast of Canada. It's still, it's always the same mentality. It's always, you're going to make sense in the dollar for every piece of investment you put in. But, uh, Hypothetically speaking, going forward, what's, uh, what are the big plans for, for JL this year? Well, um, a, a lot of our summer programming got canceled. So we're, uh, we always do the Maine in America festival every year. We do, um, I would do quite a bit of work for, um, uh, the U S open behind the scenes. We do, uh, some work for New York wine and food festival. Um, all those things are presumably canceled. Um, so, uh, Right now, I'm uh, I'm really working on some some things that are just very exciting for me. Um, it's uh, I get to be creative, I get to build things. So I'm working with Elaine Duff on building a. a um, uh, we're doing we do the industry distilled every Thursday, which is where we read the industry news that you don't have to. Um, and then I, I love just building those media products and those concepts and um, just putting them all together. And and uh, I know that you're I know you're on the same page with me on that one because they're just so fun to do, you know. Um, and uh, I'm working on a YouTube channel. I'm working on a big project with Chris Bidmead um, that will hopefully, um, you know, 
uh, solve this big problem that we have about getting bartenders back to work. Um, and, uh, and this is regardless of what happens with an opening or, or not. I mean, it's, it, what we're working on is, is developing a, a, a path to um, engaging your skills that you already have. And so what, what I think is what I think that we're really forgetting right now is that, um, you know, being able to make a drink or being able to manage a bar um, are not and, and being able to engage the global gig economy are not mutually exclusive. Like you don't have to um, only do one thing like these skills that you uh, can apply to this one thing do not have to apply to only that thing. Mm -hmm. And so out there in the world right now, I mean, as a small business owner, I hire virtual assistants to do things all the time, all the time. And um, if you look at my Facebook page, I've thrown a, a throw down a couple opportunities and I haven't really necessarily gotten exactly what I was looking for. Um, but they, uh, because a lot of thing, a lot of times um, the, the skills are kind of adapted in the context of hospitality. But if we get out of that mindset and we, if we say, Hey, listen, like we can, so if you can know how to run a spreadsheet, then um, you know, chances are you can do this data entry thing for me or, and, the, and I'm, not, I'm not talking about necessarily low level things either. Like there's like data entry and there's just like tweaking things and just doing comments on, on Instagram, and Facebook, but it's unbelievable. Uh, I wish everybody who's out there listening right now would go to Fiverr and Upwork, um, and take a look and say, and just search through the, the freelancers there and be like, wait a second, I can do that. And if you can't do it and it's something that interests you, you should go to YouTube and find out everything there is to know about it because it's not like they verify your skills there. <laughs> you know? well, it was actually, it was actually, I did, I did a phone call with Elaine about uh, some product research she was working on and she mentioned Fiverr and Fiverr mm -hmm. has become my best friend. Mm -hmm. I've got three people who like, I've got one guy who's going through my whole YouTube channel and doing compilation videos in different size formats and different size lengths. And then I got mm -hmm. my other guy who writes my articles for me for my podcast audio. Mm -hmm. And then I've got um, a girl in India who does all my, th my YouTube thumbnails for like five thumbnails for 10 bucks. I'm like, okay, I, they're much better than what I could do. And yeah. she literally just watches my YouTube. She's subscribed to my YouTube channel. So every time I post a new video, she just like goes and all of a sudden I just get an inbox with here's day for 43. I'm like, fantastic. Yeah. And it's not that it's not like we don't want to hire our neighbors for these things. Um, you know, I would, I would happily pay more, uh, for somebody to do it right the first time. Mm -hmm. Uh, and for somebody to had, a, who had an understanding of my business to say like, Hey, this is, um, I have an idea and this is what I would love to do. Can I do this? Like, that's like, that's what I would pay more for. Uh, a lot of times I find myself cruising around Upwork or Fiverr looking for things that I haven't thought of. And, um, and, you know, having somebody who, you know, who is familiar with your industry and your, and your, um, and your particular niche is very, very important. So, if, so if, um, somebody DM'd me on my Facebook right now and said, Hey, listen, I know how to be, a, I can build a course, a course for you. Uh, mm -hmm. And, uh, I can, you know, based on that, or I can take your videos and I can, I can trim them into very short consumable pieces for your Instagram stories. Um, you know, it's, uh, the, part of the problem is for, for people like us that are independents is that, um, you know, we don't always know what we need. And mm -hmm. so, um, what the difference is between the people who put their, uh, their profiles up on Fiverr and Upwork and the people who I would, who I'm always looking for are the people who say, I can help you do, do what you do, but better. Mm -hmm. And, um, and you know, so what, you know, uh, I just, I just want people to start thinking it in terms of being an independent business because bartenders, if you don't show up to work, um, you don't, you're not going to get paid. And if we don't show up to work, we're not going to get paid. So what's the difference between an independent business person and a bartender? Mm -hmm. Not a whole lot. I mean, you know, uh, when you have a shift, you show up and work at the same place, but I would, I would just wish that people would think a little bit more entrepreneurial and, uh, start to evaluate themselves and to, um, you know, get out there and, and create an opportunity, plant your flag in the ground and say, I'm available for hire. Um, because we're like in the States, uh, I, I'm not going to wait around for a paycheck. I'm not going to wait around for uncle Sam to, to bail me out. Um, you know, I, I, that doesn't mean I'm not going to apply, yeah. <laughs> but, but it's just, you know, it's just not likely to happen. I mean, when everybody, when there's this huge vacuum on a very limited amount of funds, you know, I, you just can't wait around for that. And this is, um, you know, some people get, uh, upset and depressed and that's totally valid. Like being, having an emotional response to what's happening right now is completely appropriate and it's okay to be sad and depressed. Um, uh, but for me, 
what I found is, um, in addition to having a wonderful supportive family, like my wife and my 17 year, 17 month old son is that, um, uh, nothing makes me feel better than getting shit done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like what you were saying at the very beginning, <clears throat> like I'm trying to do a podcast a day, which everybody's like, Oh, okay. Monday to Friday. That seems like a lot. I'm like, yeah, but you got to schedule the podcast. You got to record the podcast. You got to edit down mm -hmm. the podcast and I do all my own editing and everything. So like I'll save this one and then I'll turn that into audio. And I'm like, next thing you know, it's an hour and a half, two hours gone. You're like, you just worked on one project for two hours. It's gone. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. But I, I think, I think transferable skills and what people think is hobbies right now, like you said, with Fiverr, like if you can transcribe audio, if you can read audio and write it down, or you've got any sort of writing knowledge, you can make a little side hustle out of it. 1000%. All right. Let's do, let's do a little exercise here. Uh, what do you use to, uh, to edit your podcast? Um, I use a uh, wave pad. And wave pad. Okay. All right. Everybody out there listening, go on Fiverr and go on Upwork and, and in the freelancer search tab, type in wave pad and see how many people pop up for, for saying that this is something that I can do. And if it's something, I'm sure you can go on YouTube right now and look up WavePad and find 50,000 tutorials on how to use the program. I'm sure I bet you can download it onto your computer and I bet you can, um, you know, demo the software without actually paying for it. And then once you're done with that, once you have a cursory understanding of how this piece of software works, um, go put it, uh, put a thing up on Fiverr and then maybe Sean's going to hire you today <laughs> to, edit, to edit, to edit my shit out of this. But yeah, I think it, I, I'm doing a, a seminar for fever tree next week about side hustles. And like you're talking about drop shipping and Shopify. Like if you're an artist right now and you don't want it to be an original piece of artwork, like if you don't mind it not being an original piece of artwork, there's canvas drop shipping and there's shoe drop shipping and there's t-shirt drops. You can basically drop ship whatever the hell you want. Out yep. of the US and use Alibaba blew my mind. Oh like, yeah, and, and AliExpress, I was just like, whoa! Like half of the shit we buy on on Amazon mm -hmm. is is yep. marketed by a third party who just uh, it's this is called Amazon FBA, where you find a product on, on Alibaba and then you either order a bunch of those things in bulk and warehouse them, or you use the FBA where they they receive it, warehouse it, and ship it off to the eventual consumer for you. And your job is to market it. Yep. And like, if you look on Ali, Alibaba, if you look on Facebook for the same products, you'll, you'll notice that they're the exact, exact same thing. Well, that's how wish made billion, how wish has become a billion dollar company. Yeah. My whole, my whole Canadian bar store, my whole Canadian bar store platform is all drop shipping out of, out of, uh, out of China. So shipping yeah. does take a little bit longer, especially right now, which has been a bit of a nightmare. Usually it's like 11 days and it's getting up to 18 right now, which pisses a few people off. Mm -hmm. But, uh, it's a small little side project that I've made a little bit of coin out of and I do my swag store for BC spirits and yeah, I've got all these all day. When I talk to people about drop shipping and I talk to people about Shopify, they're just like, Oh, that seems too hard. I'm like, uh, but it's, it's not, it's not at all. Like it's plug and play. It's intuitive. It's fun. Like, yeah. If you can bang out a 12 hour shift without taking a meal or a bathroom break, how hard can that be? <laughs> I mean, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> like we, we have a, like, a 12 hour shift without taking a meal or a bathroom break. You can do anything you want. <laughs> yes, you can. See, like, I feel like we just have, don't have a full understanding of our, what our, our, what our capabilities are. Like if we just, uh, you know, funnel the, these creative and, uh, and physical energies from doing a shift at a bar, uh, serving, bartending, bar backing, busing, whatever it is, um, these can be applied to hustles that you can do on your phone. And this is like people underestimate this tool as well. Like this is more computing power than was available when they put the first person on the moon right here. It's in our pocket Like you don't need a laptop. You can get a Bluetooth keyboard that can do uh, word processing on free software and on the Google drive. Like there's just like, please, if anybody is, is uh, in want of, of a hustle, tell me where your interests are and I will help you find your hustle. A hundred percent. 100%. Well, I really appreciate your time, man. This is awesome. You too. Thank you so much for reaching out. I appreciate it. And I love your show, man. Oh, thanks, buddy. <laughs> I, I, it, it, for me, uh, I'm always still uh, that 26-year-old Australian kid who came to Canada in 2006. And uh, for me, like having someone, someone like yourself, like having my, I, I would class Philip Duff as my mentor, like having the opportunity as a youngster from Australia who 
looked up to everybody coming through the ranks and then gets to move here and all of a sudden gets to hang out with Philip Duffett Tales and can call Simon Ford and hang out with you. And I'm just like, it's still surreal, even though I've been in the industry for as long as I have and achieved what I, well, I think what I, is a reasonable amount of stuff, but to be able to hang out with people like yourselves and, and peers and mentors um, that I look up to still and sort of drive myself. Like I, I watch, I watch a lot of your stuff and consume a lot of your content and sort of pushes me to try and be better than you. Which <laughs> that was you. You listened to my podcast. Thank you. <laughs> oh, so you feel the same way. I saw the <laughs> one. I was like, yeah, <laughs> awesome. It's worth it. Well, thanks a lot, man. I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Sean. Stay safe, stay healthy. You, you too. I'll chat to you soon. Bye, y'all. Thanks for listening, Pose Shifters. I well, hope you enjoyed that episode. I really enjoy sitting down with friends and peers and uh, just chatting about the industry and getting down to the nuts and bolts of what's really going on out there. Uh, make sure you like, subscribe, comment, everything on all the platforms. Just hit it up and I'll do my best to answer any queries or questions you have. I'll see you next week, guys. Bye.